thank you everybody for, for attending. It's great to, to be here today. So um, maybe some of you attended four years ago um, a talk I, I, uh, I was giving here. Uh, it, it was a wake up call for SATCOM security. And uh, well, we presented a lot of different vulnerabilities, backdoors in satellite communication terminals, and we elaborated uh, some uh, theoretical scenarios about um, the problems that uh, are uh, located or are uh, derived from these uh, products. So, um, well, that research uh, was not accept, exempt uh, from polemic uh, because some people thought it was impossible or it was extreme, the worst case scenario. So, um, in, in this research in 2018, uh, I'm going to demonstrate that with three real world examples that uh, what we um, presented in uh, 2014 uh, was actually uh, real. Um, this is a little bit weird, but we are going to start with the conclusions in order to avoid any potential misunderstanding because this is a very sensitive topic. So this research is mainly focused on three uh, different uh, sectors, the aviation, the maritime, and the military. For each of them, we have uh, different metrics. And uh, we are talking about a security risk if uh, there is any uh, problem with the communications or um, the usual um, security issues we are used to, to see. Uh, then we have the flight safety risk. So this means that is there any real uh, situation or a problem that can be uh, uh, put it at risk uh, the, the safety of the people or the aircraft? And then we have the radio frequency risk because we are presenting, um, uh, we are introducing the radio frequency attacks using uh, compromised uh, SATCOM equipment. So um, this has to be uh, taken into account. And then we have the likelihood and the attack vector, which, uh, well, it's uh, obvious. So to, it's important to note for the aviation uh, sector, there is no safety risk. Uh, We'll explain later uh, why, uh, why this is the, the case. Um, for the maritime sector, obviously there is no flight, flight uh, safety risk, but we have a radio frequency uh, risk that, that uh, it may have uh, safety implications. So that's important. And then for the military, um, there is no um, radio frequency risk, at least as far as, uh, as I know. And uh, obviously, the, there are uh, security risks for all the, the sectors. This research is also about the traditional concept of hacking I, grow, I, 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 I have in my mind. It's uh, when you don't have access to a system, but uh, you really want to know everything about that, uh, that uh, system. So this is how I, I did it. I did it, and that's uh, the talk. So the conclusions um, for also for the for the uh, three um, uh, different uh, sectors and, and an additional one which is uh, which may be impacted by by these problems the space one is the, the following the, we have different threats for each uh, sex, section um, for the aviation we have the ability to disrupt intercept or modify non-safety. This is important, non-safety, because we, are, uh, we can control, we can manipulate uh, the, 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 the in-flight Wi-Fi, the internet connectivity that is used by the crew and the passengers, but the safety communications are uh, using a different communication channel. So this is important to note. We have the ability to attack the crew and passengers' uh, devices. Uh, we have also uh, the ability to manipulate uh, the SATCOM antenna positioning and the transmissions. Uh, for the maritime, uh, it's pretty much the same, but in addition to this, we have the ability to perform cyber physical attacks uh, using the um, radio frequency that we can control from the antenna. Uh, for the military, uh, the concept of safety may be a, diff a little bit different if we, if we can pinpoint the location of a of a military, of a military um, base or military units, then they might put at risk the, those, uh, those uh, bases or, or units. And um, for the space, as we control um, 
as we, we are going to see hundreds of these uh, satellite communication terminals, it is possible to perform uh, an, an attack, mainly a disruption attack against a satellite transponder. So that's the, the, the conclusions. And then we go to, to the content. Uh, it all started in uh, November 2017. I took a flight from uh, Madrid to Copenhagen. Uh, uh, it was basically in Norwegian, which is well known for offering um, uh, free Wi-Fi wi uh, in, in flight. So, well, I mean, I, I just uh, ran uh, Wireshark to see what's go was, what was going on. And there were some weird things. The first, first of all, uh, the internal IP uh, got assigned was a public IP. It was a routable IP. Well, it may happen, but that's, that was a little bit weird. But then, after some time, I noticed that I was receiving some random scans from the internet uh, on my computer, and it was like um, something is really wrong here, for sure. Um, so basically, um, once on the ground, I decided to take a look at the IP ranges of uh, those uh, public IPs I, I noticed. And uh, what I found was uh, there were hundreds of uh, satellite uh, routers from Hughes. Um, and uh, one thing to note is that uh, when you access those, uh, those routers, uh, the, the, the latency is uh, higher than for terrestrial uh, networks. So that that's clearly was showing that uh, we were accessing those devices from a satellite uh, link. So. Uh, at that point, it was like, okay, some, something is wrong, but before moving further into the investigation, I decided to collect everything I could, uh, read everything I could, in order to understand what, uh, how the system was working, because I didn't want to mess in the wrong way with an in-flight aircraft, <laughs> so that's important. And fortunately for us, there are a lot of different sources uh, to get uh, information, um, because uh, there are a lot of uh, regulations involved. So when vendors uh, want to um, get an approval to operate this kind of uh, equipment, uh, they have to send uh, some uh, documents that usually are available in the, at the FCC uh, website. So there are a lot of different documents that um, are really interesting. Also YouTube uh, videos and everything. So um, I decided to, to, see, to try my luck and see if uh, Shodan was able to, to uh, capture some of those uh, in-flight uh, in um, aircraft. And actually, uh, that, that was the case. So I think that, uh, John, if you are over here, you have to add airplanes to, to Shodan because uh, uh, that was very useful for me. Um, basically, what we could... Uh, uh, test and uh, I, I, I was able to verify that uh, the, the fleets from the Southwest airline, uh, Norwegian and Icelander, uh, were exposed to the internet and it, it was possible to access all those uh, aircraft. Obviously, some of them were, uh, when they are not flying, this, this system is not operating, so you can't access at, uh, at certain times. So how this system works. So um, there is a standard, the uh, ARING uh, 791, which is intended for the um, KU, KEI uh, band earth stations. And according to this uh, standard, we, we can um, identify the, the different components of the system. We have the modem, which is, or which was the device that was actually exposed to the internet. And it's a control device, but it's built on top of a, of a uh, huge uh, HX200. Uh, we have the antenna control unit, uh, which comes from a product from Tekon, uh, the QStream 1000. We have the SMU, the server manage management unit, which is an airborne server uh, which uh, controls some core functionalities, and it also has, um, so has uh, some uh, other interfaces we'll see later. And, uh, Finally, the satellite antenna assembly and the high power transceiver, they both uh, come from the same product, the QStream 1000. 
You can see some pictures here. On the left, we have the uh, server management unit, which is basically a Linux system, and uh, it's the, the airborne server, which uh, hosts the in-flight portal. So this is exposed to the uh, passengers. So if you access to the in-flight uh, Wi-Fi, uh, you can access the, the, the in-flight portal, and that's located on the SMU, which is also an attack vector. Uh, it also has the 3G functionality to receive updates and remote uh, control once the aircraft is on the ground. And uh, then we have the MDU, which is actually the device that works, was exposed. So um, this is basically a VxWorks um, uh, device uh, with uh, different services. We have the common ones, Telnet, FTP, uh, web, uh, web server, uh, SNMP, but, but then we also have some proprietary uh, services uh, that, that I uh, reverse engineered, and we will see later. So uh, we have seen the uh, SMU and, and the MDU, but uh, if you remember that there were another uh, three components, the high power transceiver, um, the antenna control unit, and the, uh, and the antenna. Uh, so if you can see um, here, the, between the antenna control unit and the high power transceiver, the, there are a couple of interfaces that are, in, that are interested for, interesting for us. Uh, there is a discrete uh, signal, and then we have Ethernet. Um, so this is important because, um, because uh, they are accepting uh, command and control um, commands from the Ethernet interface. So, okay, I could access the web server for the MDU, but I wanted to, to get the firmware uh, as usual, so I wanted uh, to, to to analyze the firmware. So uh, the way to, to, to get the firmware uh, was basically, um, I, I read some, um, some documentations and I noticed uh, an interesting um, functionality, which is uh, the fallback updater. So it's important to note that in 2014, I discovered several backdoors in huge product. So, when I saw that this product uh, was also from Hughes, it was suspicious. So um, the, the, the fallback updater basically allows you to uh, deploy a new firmware to the unit uh, without asking for any password or something like that. So it's like, oh, something is wrong here. <laughs> and effectively, and, and that's right, it, it, there, there was a backdoor, uh, the Swarfitz uh, backdoor. Uh, basically, this is the code from the, from the fallback updater. Um, it uh, tries to connect to the um, VxWork cell, and it sends the user and the password. You can see uh, both of them, and that's it. You are uh, in. So. Well, I, I, have, I had to try this on the real uh, MDU from an in-flight aircraft, and uh, well, it worked. So we basically we had a VX work cell at uh, 30,000 30, feet uh, in an in-flight aircraft from the ground through the internet. If you know a little bit about uh, VX works, once you have access to the cell, you can basically read memory, write memory, execute arbitrary code, and um, it's over. So. But I wanted to, to really get the firmware that was running inside the MDU because I got the fallback updater, which was similar but not exact the same. So that's located in in the in that directory. We can access that through the FTP server, and it's basically a MIPS uh, image with the full uh, VxWork symbol table uh, compiled intact. So I just um, created an IDA script to uh, rebuild the, the symbol table, and it's very useful because it's a complex uh, firmware. So having the, all the names um, of the functions is really uh, interesting for us. So we have access to the system. What, what now? What can we do? So this is the post-exploitation uh, phase. So first of all, we need persistence because um, several reasons, but, but if we are going to perform an attack where the antenna is uh, moving and losing the, 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 loop, the lock to the satellite, then it's over. There is just, um, there is no connection anymore to our 
command and control server or whatever. So uh, by gaining persistence, we can deploy automatic uh, payloads to the to the MDU. And we also have to um, control the non-safety communications if we want to um, look for what's going on in the network, if we want to inject uh, malicious payloads uh, for passengers or crew, or something like that. Um, we want also to isolate terminal, the satellite terminal from the network operation center because uh, as you see in the picture, the NOC is controlling everything, including our, uh, our satellite terminal, and we don't want that. We don't want that because the NOC is, uh, can dis remotely disable the, the transmission, for example, uh, and we want to operate the satellite terminal on our own and completely isolated from the NOC. And finally, we want to turn uh, the terminal into a malicious intentional radiator. What's this? Okay, so an intentional radiator is basically a device that, uh, does, that uh, generates and emits a radio frequency. And there is an implicit rule with these devices, which is basically if there is no log, if you don't receive the carrier from the, from the satellite, then you don't have to transmit because you can uh, have a lot of uh, problems if you transmit um, and you can mess with the wrong satellite or uh, with, uh, with people or with the uh, material. So it's not a good idea to, to transmit without having uh, the proper carrier locked. So our idea is to uh, actually perform that. Uh, we want a malicious intentional radiator where I, we don't care if there is lock or not. We just want to transmit and transmit toward the direction we, we want. The firmware has a lot of functionalities and it's really big and really interesting, but we are going to focus on uh, the ones that uh, are interesting for, for our scenario. So this is the, some of the functionalities I decided to, to uh, analyze. Um, some of them can be used for as an attack vector. Some of them are mostly um, interesting from the boss exploitation um, perspective. So that's it. Let's let's start with the authentication. Obviously, we found the Swarfis backdoor in the firmware. You can see how it is added to the uh, login table in the VxWorks image. But then we we I found another another backdoor which was only for um, terminals that are operating under FIPS uh, 140 uh, two. Uh, basically, uh, it, there are some uh, specific functionalities in the web server that uh, can only be accessed uh, if you have the proper credentials, which is basically crypto and official, so it's not very complex. Um, we also have the accelerators, which are very common in the satellite industry because if you can save a byte, uh, then you save money, you save per performance, you save a lot of different uh, things. So uh, this is this is useful for as an attack vector because basically um, in this um, in this terminal there are a couple of them implemented the turbo page. Basically, when you go, when you ask for a for a web uh, website. Uh, it, uh, it goes through a proxy that is on the ground and they are using some compression algorithm and they are returning the context. So by identifying the, the functions that are involved in this functionality, we can inject our own payloads, we can um, modify the, the traffic, uh, that kind of things. Obviously, if there is a, a strong end-to-end -end encryption, then there is, it's another, another problem. Then there is an interesting feature. In this case, the, the, uh, the it wasn't present in the in the uh, aircraft from the airlines affected, but it was already implemented in the in the in the MDU. This is automatic beam switching, which is used to uh, connect to different uh, satellite beams according to um, the real-time position of the terminal. Uh, the maps uh, that are locally stored in the in the MDU, which is the modem, and uh, in order to um, perform this kind of functionality, the modem commands the antenna control unit to um, to control the when to change between beams. 
and this is interesting for, for us because uh, we can demonstrate in this way that if you compromise the modem, you can, in certain cases, not in this one, but in certain cases, you can command an arbitrary uh, ACU to perform some actions. In this case, we are talking about uh, an ACU from orbit, and as you can see in the code, it was possible to mute or unmute the block up converter, which is very interesting from the malicious um, intentional radiator perspective. Also, what about uh, isolating the terminal from the NOC? Well, as you can see, um, the NOC is able to control uh, the transmit power, the, the, uh, the, the satellite terminal uh, needs, because it's, um, I think we can oversimplify the, 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 the functioning of uh, a satellite terminal. It's like, um, it's like a, a silly device. It can perform complex tasks, but someone needs to tell how to perform those tasks. So Lenog is, uh, is telling the, the, um, the terminal, okay, use this uh, uh, power, use this uh, modulation scheme, this coding, um, that kind of things. So we want to isolate the terminal to, to avoid these kind of, of things. So I, I reverse engineered uh, the protocols used between the uh, huge uh, NOC and the, and, the, and the terminal. And there were several protocols, some of them most interesting, more interesting than others. But this one is interesting because it allows to uh, remotely disable the transmission from the terminal from the NOC. So basically, if the NOC detects something wrong with the terminal, he just, uh, it just can disable the, the transmission. But we don't want that because we don't want to, to stop the transmission. So you can see that, for example, the enable disable transmit is just implemented as a flag. So they are, uh, if, they, if the terminal receives this uh, packet from the NOC, it uh, sets a flag. And then uh, in, other part, in other functions in the firmware, they check whether that flag is active. And if so, they disable the transmission or they uh, enable the transmission. Obviously, we can patch this. We can control whether the transmission is enabled or not. And there are other uh, proprietary services in the network services section. Um, for example, if we read um, the, the patent, or the, not the patent, but the, the licensing form that uh, Global Eagle uh, sent to the FCC to get the approval to operate um, uh, satellite terminals, you, you can, we can see how uh, the antenna pointing uh, is um, complemented or it's uh, implemented. So it's interesting because the antenna control unit is requesting data from the MDU, which is something we control. And they are requesting a snow from, uh, from the MDU to see if everything is correct um, in terms of re the receiving um, data. So I uh, reverse engineered the firmware to discover where this uh, implementation was located. And you can see that uh, how they initialize the, the task and they get the SNO uh, samples from the demodulator that is located in the modem and they, um, they send uh, those, that data to, to, the, to the clients. And uh, we have another uh, interesting proprietary uh, service, service, which is the host command. Uh, it's listening on the 2300 TCP, and it supports dozens of commands. You can uh, perform different functions, uh, remote control, crypto keys for transec and comsec um, uh, implementations, maintenance, configuration, everything. And it's interesting because by looking at the active connections in the MDU, uh, we can see that the antenna control unit at that IP and the server management unit, both are connected to the, uh, to the info server and the host command server, respectively. So we see that two things. They, we can control uh, the data that they are receiving, so there is a window to uh, send malicious uh, data that is going to be parsed by the SMU and the ACU, and also that we are in the same network segment, 
uh, that uh, where the, the antenna control unit and the SMU are located, so we have access to that uh, to those devices. And we can verify this by issuing an internal DNS request in the in-flight Wi-Fi. Uh, and the, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting to see that uh, the, the, the domains that uh, returned. So at that point, we uh, had uh, the whole picture of uh, how that system uh, worked. So we have uh, the server management unit and the modem, oh, the modem data unit. Everything is connected through the, through the LAN with different uh, segments, but still through the, through the MDU we can reach other devices. Uh, there is also the wireless LAN unit. I didn't focus on that device, but if you are attending DEF CON, my friend and colleague uh, that also works at IOactive is going to uh, compromise the, the operating system that is running inside the, that device. So go for it. It's Joseph and it's uh, Extreme Network. We know uh, um, the operating system, so don't miss it. And it was also interesting because by looking at the active connection, connections, I noticed there were random, uh, random uh, IPs trying to connect to the uh, telnet service. So I decided to take a look uh, to see if something was going on. And well, uh, it basically I decided to go for a specific IP and it was an IoT botnet trying to log in into the MDU from uh, in an in-flight aircraft, so it was funny. Obviously, this is uh, this um, this botnet is not prepared to infect the VX works uh, machine. So, fortunately, there was uh, no risk for the for the aircraft. In terms of the military, um, I found military satcom equipment exposed to the internet, and um, these uh, devices um, had uh, a GPS device attached. So I could locate the position of those terminals. And uh, I found that those were located in conflict zones. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this problem is still not completely uh, fixed, I think. So we are not providing further details uh, until we are uh, sure that, uh, that everything is correctly uh, mitigated. And then we go to the maritime in case. Uh, in this case, the target or the, the, the scope of, the, of this part was uh, the Intellian uh, products that you can see that they have a lot of different products for, for different uh, satellite services like Global Express or Fleet Broadband. Or this one is an Intellian um, antenna, but it's for VSAT. So, that's the basic configuration of the antenna. We have, uh, obviously, the antenna, and then we have the antenna control unit, which is the device that you can see here. Um, there are different versions of the same antenna control unit. Some of them, the most, uh, the modern, the most modern uh, ones, uh, support uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all the wireless connections you want uh, to improve the user experience. But uh, the underlying problem is that uh, well, it's a mess. Uh, I, I try to, to find the firmware in the main website. Uh, you need login, so I decided to, to Google uh, to see what if I could find something, and I found this. I mean, I didn't even left this leave this message. And okay, okay when I read this, it was like mm, I am not sure about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so effectively, <laughs> or that's I mean, as you as may expect, uh, it's a, to a total mess. I mean, it's, uh, you have backdoors, you have insecure protocols, buffer overflows. Uh, it's a cap to the flag, basically firmware. So um, you can get root, I don't know, in hundreds of ways. So that's uh, that's a problem. And I observed the same pattern, random um, IPs. But in this case, it was worse because um, I decided to take a look at uh, an antenna control unit that, that was exposed. There are dozens, or hundreds of antenna control units exposed to the internet. 
And actually, in this case, uh, it was already infected by the Mirai botnet. So uh, basically, they were using a, an insecure password that is uh, in the implemented in the antenna control unit. So basically, this means that everything we can say here about this can happen uh, right now because there are malware and there is malware already infecting vessels. So let's see a demo. Um, the, basically, the, the antenna control unit um, uh, is uh, using a, a proprietary protocol to control the, 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 the antenna. And uh, well, it's, uh, you can uh, reverse engineer this protocol from different sources. Uh, using the antenna binary, the antenna control unit binaries using a mobile application they have to uh, to connect to the antenna control unit wirelessly uh, there are a lot of uh, different ways so it's not uh, complicated okay so we have a game here with a bunch of Nazis which is always fine to always funny to kill some Nazis so we we can <laughs> We're going to try to uh, our luck and see if the antenna moves with our pointer and we can kill some Nazis. <laughs> That's it. It's, it's safe. It, we are not transmitting, so <laughs> no damage. Okay, so this basically um, means we can uh, control the, the antenna. Um, and then we move to the cyber physical attacks, which is an interesting development in this research. So we are controlling an antenna. An antenna is just, uh, well, just, no, it's a way to, um, to, to, uh, to um, expose or transmit radio frequency, which is electromagnetic energy in the end. So, um, we have demonstrated, we have the ability to um, transmit whenever we want or to control the antenna positioning. Uh, so what can we do with this? Um, so what happens with, uh, when the electromagnetic uh, energy um, uh, reaches a target, a point. Okay, so we have that the electric field is, um, is uh, exerting a force we, uh, on the charged particles. So this may happen that um, it's, this may attract electrons or uh, push away electrons. And when this uh, happens, uh, which is the, quant the quantum jump, then uh, some photons are emitted or absorbed. So there is basically um, energy uh, that uh, is uh, being um, uh, transmitted. So this uh, can cause uh, uh, a thermal effect on biological tissues. And this is something that is, uh, has been demonstrated is the only um, adverse effect against uh, biological tissues that has been demonstrated according to radio frequency. There are different um, uh, scenarios after that, but that happens. It's uh, scientifically demonstrated. So we can potentially burn people or we can also uh, create malfunctions in electronic or electrical systems, mainly by, by coupling. So as you can see in the picture, this, is, has, this has been known for years in the military, um, in the military uh, industry. So when, when the vendor or when vendors want to receive an approval for, for the antennas, they have to um, fill some form, they have to present some documents with a radio frequency um, hazard analysis, uh, and this can be done uh, in different ways. They can uh, take the, the measurements from, the, from a, a, an antenna in an echoic uh, chamber, or they can simulate, <clears throat> they can simulate uh, the measurements. And the FCC is providing all the approach to, the, to this. So uh, basically, I, I, uh, I uh, decided to take that, uh, that approach. So I took the, the equations from the, uh, that uh, FCC uh, uh, bulletin. Uh, I built uh, a model to um, simulate uh, the potential effects for the, 
for the antennas to demonstrate if it was possible or not to um, perform a cyber physical attack because all the, uh, the levels that are uh, the radio frequency levels you are exposed to are, uh, are properly regulated so you, you need to comply with those levels. So it's something I, I, I'll upload to the materials for this talk uh, but it's basically a, an Excel uh, with uh, the model um, implemented in it. So we have different parameters and we can model the antenna and then we can get the f far field because we are focused on the far field. We, are, we don't really uh, think there is a scenario where we can use the, the near field for the antenna. So um, as you can see for, for this um, uh, for this a maritime antenna, which is pretty similar to, to this, uh, there is, um, there is a, a value that is higher than the regulatory level in the, in the, at the beginning of the far field. So uh, what happens with this? Okay, so if you are a person that are exposed to this uh, radio frequency uh, beam and uh, you, are, you don't know you are exposed to, to that beam, there may be a problem with, for your uh, safety, for your health. So let's talk about some scenarios in the maritime sector. Imagine a cruise ship, which is a real picture with a couple of Intellian antennas, and you can see uh, there is an antenna here, and uh, imagine that you can control the antenna, and you can force the antenna to point toward the people that are here or here, because we can control uh, the, the positioning of the antenna. And the, the antennas usually have uh, some uh, controls, software controls, uh, to avoid these kind of scenarios. Mm, uh, these are the blocking zones. So you can, um, you can uh, set up a blocking zone according to the azimuth and the elevation of the antenna in order to prevent these uh, scenarios. But in this case, we, uh, we managed to bypass that, that, uh, that protection and it is possible to use anything, any, any uh, azimuth or elevation, so that, that's not working. Or you can also think in a cargo vessel, uh, imagine that the, the compromised antenna is located here, and you can um, illuminate the bridge. That's also a problematic for uh, people or instruments aboard. What about the aviation? Okay, we uh, built the model as well, and uh, for the far field power density at the beginning of the far field, uh, there was also a, a regulatory level higher than expect or higher than the, the maximum uh, permitted. But again, in this case, uh, it's difficult or it's in, impractical to find a scenario where this can lead to a safety risk. Let's uh, put an example. This is a picture of the Atlanta airport. You can clearly identify some Southwest uh, uh, airplanes. Even you can identify the radom for the SATCOM antenna. So imagine that by any reason we have compromised those uh, aircraft. We are able to transmit toward any direction. There is uh, a regulatory minimum distance between aircraft. So at the minimum distance uh, we can reach people or other aircraft there is no risk for the, uh, for the safety of people or instruments. Because we have to take into account that then due to the nature of the aviation sector, they, they, they have been exposed to, the, to high intensity radiated fields for years because they are in the, in the path from the ground transmitters to the satellite. So they have developed the compensating controls, they have developed the proper uh, mitigations and um, to prevent any kind of problems with uh, radio frequency uh, attacks. So there is no, no risk, even if we consider that um, we have compromised hundreds of uh, these antennas and we are pointing at the same time against um, an aircraft. The regulatory level modern aircraft um, comply with is, um, is, uh, is higher than the, 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 the uh, the electric field strength we can achieve. So even 
we have to take in, into account that the aircraft are uh, certified for um, levels that are usually higher than the, the own certificate uh, levels that, that are required. So, uh, according to our figures, according to the inputs we have received from the, from the industry, the, from the aviation industry, we conclude that there is no safety risk for the, for the aircraft. We can control non-safety communications, that kind of things, but we should be safe. I mean, there is no problem. I came here by plane, so <laughs> it's, it's no problem. And uh, this has been one of the most complex um, scenarios we have faced in, order to, in, in terms of uh, disclosure. We reported this to different authorities and entities um, we unfortunately we were unable to contact Intellian, so all the issues uh, we have been talking about in the maritime sector are still out there. Don't do anything wrong, because there are some important uh, issues uh, in in this field. So don't don't do it. And special thanks for uh, Peter Leme from the Aring 791 uh, standard and uh, to uh, AI SAC. And uh, thank you very much to all, for all the people that have been involved in this research uh, from the logistic perspective, because it has been very, very complicated. So thank you very much to the workers of Black Hat, uh, to my colleagues at the iActive Madrid Lab. Uh, thank you, everyone. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>